what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.tv. My name is Alan. I'm Chris. Chris, how's it going? It is going very well. Good, good. You're staying out of the heat, staying cool. It's the summer. I am. It helps that I'm trying to cram in a lot of movies prepping for our film festival that'll be in September. So yes, I have not actually seen outside in a while. So. <laughs> That's probably good. It is a little toasty at times. And uh, of course, movie theaters are notorious for being nice and cool. So this that's where true. we tend to hang out a little bit more. And that's what's leading us to our episode today as we do have some films to talk about. Uh, for Candle Films, we always go through at least one or two movies with a film review. Today, we have two movies we'll be reviewing. Then we'll lead in some movie news and discussion about those news items. And then we'll close out the show with our recommendations of the episode movies or films we think you ought to check out although spoiler i will be breaking the rules today Mm. i will not be talking about a film that you can find on itunes or amazon or anywhere else as of today but we'll get to that later you're gonna give a rave review of a sandwich at a restaurant that's right i'm not even i think you're reviewing the big mac i'm not even recommending a film this time (laughs) it's gonna be a food item no it will be a film but i'm gonna go outside of the rules a little bit so just be warned about that when we get to that point. And there may be a little bit of a rant involved, too. Excellent. Okay. But let's get back to our main topics of the episode on Foot Candle Films. The thing we really spend the most time on when we get together is reviewing current films that we've seen. And we've got two of them to review today. The first one is the latest film from writer-director Edgar Wright, which is Baby Driver. Then we will have the latest from Bong Joon-ho, he of Snowpiercer, and uh, the host and some other films, his latest, which went straight to Netflix, which we will probably talk about as well when we get to the review, his latest is Okja. And then, of course, we'll do news and we'll do recommendations. So, Chris, are you ready to crank up the engine and get this get this car chase started? Yeah, pedal down. Let's do it. All right. First up is Baby Driver. There he is. Hey, hey baby. I used to listen to music all the time. He had an accident when he was a kid. He still got a hum in the drum. Plays music to drown it out. That's what makes him the best. Aren't you mysterious? Maybe. Chris, I could I could set up this film Baby Driver by talking about Edgar Wright and you know his filmography, the whole Cornetto trilogy that he did uh, with Simon Pegg, where you had um, Shaun of the Dead, you had Hot Fuzz, you had uh, the uh, the um, World's End, mm-hmm. his trilogy there. We could talk about his falling out with Marvel and his plans to have done the Ant Man movie. That kind of he he left that project probably due to some creative differences. There's a lot of other things we could talk about leading up to this film. I'm going to focus on something that we as critics probably don't like to focus on, and that is Rotten Tomatoes. All right. We use Rotten Tomatoes as a good barometer to just know, all right, is this movie even going to be worth our time? That's how I use it anyway. I don't live and die by the Rotten Tomatoes score, but I do look at it and say, all right, before I go out and plunk down my 10 bucks, unless this podcast is requiring me to go review this film, <laughs> is this worth my time to go see? Sure. Rotten Tomatoes is basically saying what percentage of the top writ critics in the country say that this film is positive. It doesn't say whether it's the best film. It doesn't say anything else about it from a, a level of quality. It's just what percentage said it's good, what percentage said it's bad. Right. Now, as of the time this morning when I checked, Baby Driver is 97% Rotten Tomatoes. Right. Some one or two poor critics decided that they were going to fight the trend and, and go negative on it. I even looked at the audience rating, which is normally lower than sure. on, on top critical films. Normally, the audience maybe didn't respond to it as well. Right. It's 93% of the audience liking it. Okay, so there is a huge groundswell of support for this film, both critically and it looks like audience-wise as well. Chris, you and I have known each other a really long time. One, one of the things I really always admired about you 
is you're not afraid to be a contrarian. Nope. You're not afraid to be someone who'll say, eh, I don't agree with the masses on this one. I have my own path. I have my own likes and desires. <laughs> so my question to you, Chris, in setting up this film, Baby Driver, before I even tell you anything about the plot or go through who the actors are, are you falling in line with the critics or are you going to be the Chris Fry contrarian and, and fight the trend on this film? I want to know where you are on this. So, spoiler, Alan and I actually saw this movie at the same time at a night showing and did not sit next to him, actually sat behind him so that way I couldn't see any reactions on his face because, you know, we could save it all for the podcast. Sum it all up. Um, yeah, I, I, I think my, my statement on the film is I think it's Edgar Wright's best film. Wow. Okay. All right. So you are you are in line. You are you are one of the you're 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 you're, you're on the lemmings on the cliff. You're the, you're the following in line with the rest of the crowd. You're you're on board. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I want to get to the reasons why in just a moment. Okay. So let's do a quick review of what the film is first. Though. Sure. Okay. So we have a lead character played by uh, a Mister uh, Ansel Elgort who plays Baby. That's his name. Baby in the film. He is a he gets coerced into working for a crime boss earlier in the film before the film starts. We find that he has this relationship with a crime boss who's paid by Mr. Kevin Spacey, mm-hmm. playing a very typical Kevin Spacey role of yeah. Doc. And uh, this, he's a young getaway driver. Basically, he is his role is to help criminals who are robbing banks or doing other kind of nefarious acts to get away as fast as possible. He is a very, very good driver. Yes. But you also learn that he had some trauma early in his life, which has left him with some uh, physical impairment when it comes to hearing that he helps to supplement by constantly listening to music. The music drives him. It drives his, you know, his actions. It's, it's, it drives his life, basically. Yes. So that's the setup for the film. As the plot continues, there are some shifts and changes and relationships that make things a little more interesting for Baby as, as things go on. But we do have a film as... Edgar Wright typically does uh, very heavy on use of music, yeah. very heavy on the creative use of editing mm-hmm. um, and drawing out some really great dialogue from his characters. All that being said, Chris, why don't you tell me if I had to ask you the number one thing that you've, that makes you feel like this was Edgar Wright's best movie because he has done some other great movies. What makes this his best movie? Well, so whenever he does a movie, he takes it and puts like his stamp on it, which I guess is what many directors do. For example, Shaun of the Dead was a zombie film mm-hmm. and he kind of made it a buddy zombie film. Everything right. is kind of, actually, okay. Yeah. So this is, this is why I think it's his best film. He a lot of times does buddy films. Mm-hmm. Okay. Especially with the Cornetto trilogy you were talking about. Shaun of the Dead, he put his own stamp on a zombie movie, but he made it a buddy zombie movie. Good. Okay. Hot Fuzz. It was a buddy cop movie, but he put his own spin on it, kind of over the top violence, but had a lot of comedy and, you know, because kind of, that's, that's what he does. He mm-hmm. you know, dwells in comedy, comedy through horror movie, zombie, comedy through cop movie. That's what he does. Outworld's End was his sci fi comedy. Okay. But it was also buddies because it was a bunch of guys getting together, hitting a bunch of bars. That was his whole spin. What I liked about Baby Driver is it is a caper thriller crime heist type movie, but he puts his own spin on it because it's Edgar Wright doing it. And instead of it being a buddy movie, which all of his other ones have been, and I like all of them, but he kind of breaks with that. And instead it is a romance thriller. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated the fact that it wasn't just like a buddy movie. It was a romance thriller. He kind of broke with it a little bit. Um, I think the writing and I think the writing was some of his best, hmm. the way he was able to do the story and flashbacks. So that's, I guess that's my defense of okay. why I thought it was one All of right. his better films. So, well, my that's take, what I can pin down. Sure, no, I understand, and we'll get into some more more likes, I'm sure, shortly as well. Uh, I will say, for the record, so I went, I took my uh, my middle son to this yeah. film. First rated R movie. In First the rated R movie in the theater. So a little momentous there. He's almost 16 years old. So he's on that border where it's like, you know, I read the reviews. I'm like, all right, I know this is going to be language and violence. But that seems to be the kind of the main, the main reasons for being rated R. Which that's Edgar yeah. Wright's thing. He yeah. does like some violence and language. That's kind of his yeah. thing that makes him rated R. Um, and, and I asked my, my son afterwards, I'm like, all right, what'd you think? And it was, it's amazing. It, 
if anybody ever wanted to question whether he's actually my birth son or not, <laughs> just knowing that he sees movies, it looks like very similar to how I do is, is, is great. Hmm. He told me, he said, dad, the first 30 minutes of this movie, I thought this was the best movie I had ever seen. And I said, son, I'm with you. I, the first 30 minutes of this film, actually 30, 40 minutes, I'm in heaven. I am loving every single beat, every single moment. My concern is that I felt like the first 30, 45 minutes of this film was so perfect. It actually kind of set up such a high threshold for me that I do feel like it lost some of the energy getting to the, the home stretch. I feel like, and, and not going into too many details on plot, but I, I feel like there's a point where Baby feels like he is out from under the thumb of, of Doc at some point in the film, but then he gets brought back in against his wishes. At that point, I felt like a lot of the energy of the film was, was, was diminished. It was still enjoyable. And here's the thing, is that if I saw the second, the, 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 the final half of the film, if somehow it was its own film... I would still find it to be a terribly entertaining film. It's just, unfortunately I went through the first half, which just was genius. And I felt like we just lost a little bit of the style and the, the energy that I felt like the first half gave us. Now I'm by all no means saying I didn't enjoy I love the film. I just wish that the ending had been as, as, as energetic and stylish as I felt like the first half was. Disagree. Okay. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, though, mm -hmm. and you're not wrong about the film being kind of, let's say for simplicity's sake, two parts. Okay. Like that opening 45 minutes, I agree, is just perfect. amazing. It's perfect. Really good. Yeah. Um, part of that opening 45 minutes is the opening credit scene yeah. <laughs> is <laughs> really, really so good. So good. And then after that, there is... Ansel Eggert, uh, baby kind of strolling and getting coffee, his first scene strolling and getting coffee, which complements the opening credit scene because it comes right after it and is very intensive with music and him kind of dancing to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also really good and really amazing. So that complements some of the opening 45 minutes. Really good. And then you have some heists that take place. Well, and the like, opening heist, even before the opening credits, right. is right. awesome. I mean, right. it is like one no, of the is. best car chase sequences I've ever seen. The second half that you're referring to, I think the momentum does change, but it becomes more about the romance. And I think it, it also, it becomes real life and it's not pleasant. You get dragged mm. down in it. And this fantasy that had been built up in the first, you know, 20, 30, 45 minutes of, Oh, look how cool this is. He's such an expert, but just like all of us, at some point he's dragged back down in the real mm. world he can't get out. He It's not as happy and go lucky as he thought it was going to be. Right. And I think for me, that sets up a much more interesting film. And I'll say, I think an easier film to write mm -hmm. for Edgar Wright, even though I think this is one of his best written films and I really like it. If you had done something where it was set up so it's high energy, heist, 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 all the way to the end of the film... I think it would have gotten repetitive and boring, but maybe not. Maybe you could write it somehow so that it wasn't. I felt like it needed one more car chase. I, nope. I disagree. I, I, I disagree. I do feel like it was lopsided. I, I felt like we had two big car chase scenes. The first one was genius. The second one, I felt like, you know, the one that involved Jamie Foxx and Flea, <laughs> uh, that crew, uh, it was a little more haphazard, but it was meant to be haphazard. It was a very ugly heist. I mean, it didn't go well. It right. was it was bad. Right. But then we really didn't have another great set piece with with a car chase the whole rest of the film, you know. And not to say I'm I'm sitting here like a, a Joe Schmo saying, "Ah, oh, I need this is supposed to be a car chase movie." Where's my other car chases? It's just the energy that those those scenes carried. I felt like we just didn't have in that last thirty minutes of the movie. Now again. I'm not saying that last 30 minutes is bad. Again, you put that last 30 minutes on most other action crime movies. It's awesome. It's just, again, I did feel like the film was very lopsided. I hear what you're saying about I, the more real life. And yes, I, I can agree see it's that, different. Yeah. but it is lopsided. And I guess just after such a high in that first half, I came away from the second half a little disappointed, hmm. but the film as a whole, I still really, really liked. So that's well, kind of where I am with it. Yeah. I, I felt the switching of gears <laughs> for the second half. 
and it didn't bother me as much. Okay. Right. So here I'm not disagreeing, but I just it didn't bother me as you much. Didn't bother I'm still, you I didn't see say, it as much of a. It didn't bring you down with from your enthusiasm of the film. Correct. Even though you noticed there was a shift. And I will say, so yeah, you know, if I'm going to say some negatives, so that way it's not like I'm just glowing, glowing, glowing. Mm-hmm. I will say some things that are two things basically. There's a resolution between. I'm not going to get into spoilers, but there's a kind of a resolution towards the end of the film between baby and doc. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was maybe a little rushed. Mm. I'm not rough, but it just, I felt like, wow, that was pretty quick. Um, and I, I I bought it because of what had been set up through the rest of the film, but I thought maybe it was a little convenient and rushed. Okay. Um, The only other thing is I will say the first, okay. So there's the opening credits and then there's, the use of music with baby when he's getting coffee and walking mm-hmm. on the street, that was so amazing that I was kind of thinking like you're saying, I wasn't, you know, demand or wanting more car chases. Cause we, you know, get some action and stuff, but I was wanting another scene with music that specifically was that kind of innovative yeah. There are parts when he is walking on the street that you actually see words from the song yeah. on signs or graffiti on posts and stuff like that. Like, so it's kind of breaking the fourth wall in mm-hmm. some ways. I just, we never I, got I, that level of creativity. Right. The, the latter half of the film, I guess that's probably part of my issue with it. I'm saying it became a very routine crime heist film where the first half had set this up to be a very creative, inventive heist, heist film. And I just felt like that energy was gone in the second half. I, I'm with you on that. The only time I remember the second half or definitely in the last 30, 45 minutes, the last big action scenes and, and, and uh, energy going on there. The only moment I remember where they kind of referred back to the use of music, if there was a couple of scenes where the gunfire going on was very much in time with the music. And, you know, and again, that's fine, but there was nothing to the level of what we saw in the first half from a creativity standpoint. So I just, I just felt like it became very, a little more pedestrian. It was still a well-written ending. It was still well-written final scenes. I love the codas, the the moments after the end, you know, I thought were really well done. Let me me just, okay, this is, okay. (laughs) So really liked the first 45 minutes. I agree that, you know, kind of halfway through it did kind of shift, but what really won me over was the ending. Yeah. And the reason why we're talking like the very end, without not getting the big into final without, action without scene, without getting into the, a yeah. lot of specifics, because I don't want to spoil basically it. right before credits roll. Um, so I'm not really good on history, but I try to be a little bit better on film history, mm-hmm. but I didn't get a degree. So mm-hmm. sue me, but there was a thing called the production code. Yes. And I'm going to probably bastardize it. Cause they again, haven't taken a class on it, but basically back in, what was it? 30s, 40s, 50s, around mm-hmm. in that time, they would make noir movies, sometimes crime movies. But Hollywood said as kind of a rule, hey, studios, if somebody does a crime, they got to do the time. Like, they couldn't get out scot-free. There was like, so no matter what movie you were watching, <laughs> it was just like, that's the way it had to be. So they kind yes. of controlled the way movies ended. And some Crime kind of doesn't pay has to be the message that people get. So right. a lot of times, like the film that I deplored, Pain and Gain, even though crime, crime <laughs> didn't pay for them, but glorifying violence or glorifying crime. And sometimes I have a problem with that because I'm not sure what kind of statement it's really trying to make. Um, yeah. One of the problems I have with Wolf of Wall Street, not to go down yeah. that role sure. or rat hole, but mm-hmm. through the use of black and white and then like really bright colors and stuff, the end of this film kind of had a, and because of some events that happened kind of had a production code type mm-hmm. thing to mm-hmm. it which I found really kind of cool. And maybe it was done on purpose to try to pay homage and stuff. Like, I don't know. I really, that ending just kind of hyped me back up so that I maybe forgot that tone did shift a little bit there. And maybe it was not as action packed as the first 45. So that, that really, well, the problem with the second half, it was terribly action packed. I just didn't feel like it was very creative, creative action, packed. action packed. It was actually so over action packed. that It was like, it almost reminded me a little bit of some of the superhero movies that I complain about where I feel like the last 20 minutes is just kind of over the top. Let's just throw a whole bunch of stuff on the screen. I kind of felt like, and there was nowhere near that bad, but I kind (laughs) of felt like the last 20 minutes, the big action set piece is like, okay, they're just, there's a lot of explosions. There's a lot of gunfire. There's a lot of running. There's a lot of fighting. It's like, okay, just kind of bring me back Edgar to like what you were doing in the first half. Give me mm-hmm. something a little more interesting to watch than just constant action fighting. Um, but going back to the ending, I agree with you completely. I think honestly, 
there's a moment where you feel like the film's going to end and it's going to end on a very, what I, what we typically see nowadays in these kind of films. And then when you realize that there's one more beat and uh Oh, okay. Because of that beat now, this is going to happen to this character. Mm-hmm. And it was a little surprising. Yep. And then you wait for a little bit longer and you think, okay, maybe they're going to end it on a more down note. Not, no. Okay. They, they actually came to another ending and it was a satisfying ending. It's I like, thought it was yep, extremely I'm good. Satisfying. So I'm with you on that. Absolutely with you on that. I thought the end, the real ending was really good. Gotcha. Um, so I will say likes wise, I, again, the first half of the movie to me, perfect, perfect. Everything, the characters, the, 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 the direction, the editing, the music, everything was just perfect. It really was about halfway through. It's like, yeah, I'm starting to see it go off the track a little bit. Hmm. And yes, the car references are very intentional right now. <laughs> um, Kevin Spacey, he is prototypical Kevin Spacey, but it works. When he is, when he is on as Kevin Spacey, he's always good. You know, well, so I really liked his role. The here. performances, yeah, yeah. So the, Kevin Spacey, I really like Lily James as Deborah. I thought I she do. was really, really good. And Ansel Edgord as Baby, I thought was great. I mean, yeah. it's just he had a lot he had to do in this film. You know, not just because he's the main character or the title character. I mean, he had to convey both confidence and lack of confidence. He had to convey both the fact that you know hearing was an issue for him and the music drove him, but yet. He's wrestling with a lot of different things going on. Absolutely. He's both found happiness in his life now at certain points, but he's got pain from the past. He's trying to avoid that pain in the future. I mean, it's just, there's a lot to wrestle with and he pulled it off. Great. I thought he was really good. I th- I thought this was a very strong, strong cast. All the names that you've mentioned, all the people you've mentioned, I'll throw in there, Jamie Foxx and, uh, John Hamm. Is that his name? John Hamm. Yeah. Yep. I-, I liked, I liked both of them. Mm. Um, I liked him a lot. And actually, I can't – John Hamm, in a way – I mean, I never – I watched a little bit of Mad Men, but not a whole lot. But yeah. him kind of playing against type, yeah, I really liked. And, and I thought he was good at acting against type. My my concern with John Hamm is a real super, superficial one. The guy's just too darn good looking to be a bad guy. I'm sorry. It's just – it's tough. Mm. It is tough for me to still look at him and see him as a bad guy. But I'd, I'd – that's that was and again that's more of a personal hang up. I, I can't sure. log that as a criticism against the film. Just you know, Jamie Fox I thought was the weakest link of the film. Oh man, I do. I I, I honestly felt like he Jamie Fox has a type he can play. I felt like he had some great dialogue to work with, but I just don't feel like he really did as much with the characters I thought he could have. So that that one to me was the weakest acting link of the film. But everybody else I was on board with. I, I mean, I really thought everybody I, else was I, good. I liked Jamie Fox I actually. Right. Um, <laughs> And I haven't seen this movie, but I've seen clips of it. I think it was called Getaway. And it involved Flea in like a Bronco 4x4, like falling down oh, the highway that, yeah. at some point. <laughs> so he's in a similar vehicle, having a similar experience in this movie. So the fact that he was in it, which I don't know, that could be referential because that was an action movie. I can't imagine um, it wouldn't have something referential to it. I just thought it was so it. funny to have Flea like show I mean, up. I mean, just so random. Movie. He's yeah, in like one, totally. basically one scene. And and it, you know it's, I mean, it's yeah. clearly it's oh, him. It's, it's like, Flea's very recognizable. <laughs> yeah, so. it's hard, he's hard to miss. Um, so no, I, just, I thought the acting, I, I, Jamie Foxx, I'm not sold on in this Role, but I think everybody else was really, really sharp, and yeah. uh, and it worked really well. So, what else, other other likes you want to point out? Um, I think we've we've hit them all. I will say, so baby Ansel mm-hmm. Eggert, Eggert, he was in Fault in Our Stars, and okay, I remember I never that saw was, that. It's good, yeah. Um, bit of a tearjerker. Mm-hmm. Um, not my typical. Seems like a Nicholas Sparks type movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I saw it and I actually really, really liked it. Okay. Um, Shailene Woodley was the other right. lead in that. Correct. So. The movies that I've seen of his, Fault in Our Stars, Baby Driver, Ansel Eggert, Eggert, too bad he it was not cast as the Han Solo. I was um, thinking the exact was, same he thing. He was in the running. And in this I film, the same exa- he, he wears a lot of <laughs> times is wearing a white shirt with like a black vest yep. type oh, thing. Yeah. And it is so Han Solo-esque. Don't know if those rumors had already been thrown around and Edgar Wright kind of did that as a nod and a, kind of a funny... Again, like, it wouldn't he surprise would, me. If he that was would the do case. that type thing. Oh, yeah, he would absolutely. totally, totally do that type thing. Yeah. So that was just kind of a little Easter egg that I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I'd love to see. But I am curious to see what he does next. Mm-hmm. I don't. A lot of times, I'm all about which is stated on the show. I'm usually more about directors or writers as far as films go. I don't usually seek out um, movies just because an actor's in it. Mm-hmm. However, I will say 
Oh, if yeah. Ansel's in it, I'll be like, hey, it's one to watch. It's usually, you know, I think he's got an interesting career. So I completely agree with you there. So. Completely agree. My dislikes for the film, I think I've kind of covered them. It's just that loss of style and energy that really propelled the first half for me. I just felt like it ran out of gas <laughs> later in the film. Ah. Um, and no final chart car chase. I mean, come on. It's just, it was just screaming for that. I've, I've there, seen that. I've seen that lobbed against it. Well, it's just, there was a couple actually. moments, even I think Edgar Wright's playing with us. Cause there's a few moments where he gets into a car and you're like, okay, here we go. This is going to be awesome. And then he does it. No, he's like, he drives down a little bit of the road, gets back out and runs some more. So I almost think that he was kind of playing with us a little bit. I will say my, my son. So my son is about to be 16 years old. Yes. He's got his driver's permit. He is very, <laughs> uh, he's very fanatical about cars right now. And probably maybe safety or. Like- <laughs> well, yeah, he's a very safe car driver. Luckily, okay. but he's a big fan of Subarus and Subaru rally cars. And also he knew right off when we saw the preview for this film, the red car that was driven. So Subaru Impreza WRX. So he knew the year model. He knew everything about it. <laughs> so excited to see that car in the film. <laughs> And the car never shows back up after the first 10 minutes. <laughs> so, right. So that was the first thing that came out of his mouth, actually, at the end of the movie. It's like, was that really the only time I was going to see that car? So it just <laughs> it needed one more car chase. Just one more. Hopefully starring really the well red made. Subaru. Is that- <laughs> yeah, well, it just, it just needed that. That was, my, huh. that was my, felt like it just it needed that bookends. It needed to kind of cap back off what it started with. And it would have been, to me, a perfect film if it had ended with a, chase scene that was as well done as that first one hmm. maybe a little on the creative side something a little more inventive than what we got with just a lot of action shooting you know hitting each other with cars whatever so, so i've kind of stated i don't have any other comments to make i think i've kind of ran my gamut of and comments I'm that too. i wanted to make but closing this out i just want to ask you because i've yeah. already stated my my uh thoughts on it oh, okay as far as his filmography yeah so Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, At World's End, and now Baby no, Driver. Where I, would you put this? I will say this as... is my favorite as well. Okay. Because I liked all of his other films. I'm not the biggest Edgar Wright fan. Hmm. So I would say of the three other ones, Hot Fuzz is probably my favorite of those three. Okay. Just because I found the humor to be just really, really great. Um, World's, uh, the World's End was fine. It was good. It was enjoyable. I thought Shaun of the Dead was good and enjoyable. I will say my one remiss is I have not seen uh, Against the World, um, Scott. Oh, Scott. I totally Scott Pilgrim Scott versus Pilgrim. the World. Yeah, right. So okay. that's one of his. I, that's the only one of his I have not seen. Which is not a buddy movie because it's obviously like romance. True. Yeah. Scott Pilgrim. Yeah. So that's probably the one that I would, I would imagine might have the most similarity in a way to this film. Just because oh. main character pining for a girl having to kind of go through some challenges to get there, but I haven't seen it okay. of the ones I've seen. This is my favorite. Okay. Um, but I also didn't hold those other ones in quite as high esteem as, as you may have. So that may yeah. not be as, as much of a ringing endorsement as it is with you, but I'm still very much very positive on this film. I just, I just wish it had that one more scene, just one more <laughs> director's cut. Edgar, come on. There's a director's cut version where you've got like a 10 minute, really great, well shot, inventive car chase that caps the movie. That would make it. That would wipe away all criticism in my book, and you would now have made a perfect film. So, and if it was the red Subaru, it might wipe <laughs> Alex, away. Any Alex would be back. On, Alex would be back on board, okay. as opposed to <laughs> deflated like he was at the end of this one. Now, so fair enough. So that was Baby Driver. Obviously, we're both high on it. Chris higher than I am. I have a few more misgivings, but overall, I'm still yes, I'm still very positive on the film. I definitely think it's one of the better films I've seen in a while. So yes, I'm on board with that. Um, that is baby driver still in theaters as of the time we're recording this. Let's move on to, to our second review, which is one that is always a nice surprise when we review it. It is something that anybody with Netflix can go like right now, press a button and you're watching this film. The latest from the director of the host and the director of Snowpiercer more recently, and actually Snowpiercer, one we did review yes. on the show. Uh, Bong Joon-ho is the latest from him called Okja. Aja, we are animal lovers. Our plan is to expose Miranda, rescue Okja, and bring her back to you. Ten years in planning, on the cusp of a product that will feed millions. And what happens? That farmer girl is going to destroy us. You 
should know the situation is not good. So Okja premiered at the 2017 Cannes Film Festival. Mm -hmm. Caused a little bit of a stir. Yes. Because Netflix had the rights to it. Mm -hmm. And in France, the deal is once you premiere at Cannes, you're supposed to not have any digital distribution for a certain amount of time, which means you would then go to theaters. And then you can eventually, of course, have digital distribution. But caused this huge stink. Um, It was well received at Cannes, but then kind of the the controversy about France getting really upset, or not France, but the Cannes Film Festival getting really upset about this, so much so that they said in 2018, guess what? If you are going to only do digital distribution, then you're not going to be allowed in competition. So huge, huge stink. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So uh, you referenced the other two movies, uh, The Host and Snowpiercer, that we have seen. Yeah, Mother is one that's been on my wish list for a while to see, and I haven't had a chance to see it yet. I haven't caught up with it either, but... So this is the third film that you and I have seen by um, right. Mr. Bong Joon-ho. It, um, is his second English language. Snowpiercer was the first one where he used True. a lot of English language, has some of the same actors in this as he did in that. Mm-hmm. Um, so this has Korean, and you know you have subtitles, but it's also English language film. Right. So controversy pretty much, I guess, over. This film is now out on Netflix. Flix. Alan... Um, do you think the controversy is the only thing of note about this film or do you think there's uh, something to it? And would you urge people to check it out? I, well, first off, I don't care about the controversy. I mean, <laughs> however a film can get in front of people's eyeballs, I'm sure. all for. And yes, I prefer the experience of going to a movie theater and seeing a movie on a big screen. But over the years, and you and I have talked about this, it can't, you can't beat sometimes the idea of knowing that once a movie is out, you can honestly go in, in your living room, press a button, and you're watching it. There is something nice about that, especially a film like Okja that would not have been coming to our local movie theater, I don't think. Probably not. Not right away. We might have had to wait a little longer for it. So the fact that we can watch it along with the rest of the world the same weekend is pretty, it's pretty impressive. Um, I really like this movie. <laughs> okay. I don't why? know why. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, it's got a lot going on. It's a long movie, too. It's two hours. Yeah. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of reasons I liked it. Very few reasons that, that few, very few dislikes. My bigger question, I guess the controversy I see shifting to is I, hey. I don't know who this movie's for. Well, yeah. Because the first 15, okay, let me just say, I guess we yeah, should say what the story is. Sure. Let's, let's set up the story. Okay. Um, do you want to sure, kind of give I'll us a synopsis of it so just so people Okja, know what we're talking who's about? The title yeah. Yeah. Creature is a massive pig. S- super pig. Super pig, yes. So it is centered around the story of Mirando, the Mirando Corporation. Uh, puts these pigs out there, gives them all to a bunch of different farmers and says, Hey, we want you to grow these or whatever. It's kind of a competition in you know, 10 years or so, we're going to come back and we're going to see who's done the best who's job. Who's done the best job of growing their pig? Who's created a, the best environment for their pig and the pig is healthy and big and whatever. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, you, the one that they focus on showing you kind of the background of how the pig came up was uh, Okja, who was raised by a young girl in Korea, mm-hmm. uh, who is Miha, I think is how, or Mija, is yeah, how Mija. we're going to say her name. Mm-hmm. And... So what happens, though, after that 10 years, and the pig is, of course, huge, the company then says, okay, time for all the pigs to come back, and we're going to have a competition. Well, it's a multinational company. They're basically taking, you know, it's not like you don't have a choice to give the pig back or not. They come and get the pig. So, of course, the girl's really scared because she's not an idiot. She kind of figures out, okay, this may not go somewhere good. Well, and and she and the pig pig have become really, really close. Uh, Very good friends. The whole first 15 minutes of the film is just... You watching them be friends. Okay. Yeah. First, maybe second 15 minutes. Well, that's true. The yeah. first 15 yeah. minutes right. of this film mm-hmm. could be its own short film. Mm-hmm. Tilda Swinton. <laughs> um, I thought, no, there again, personal She plays preference. the head of the she Miranda has, Corporation. She plays the head of the Miranda Corporation. She basically gives like a presentation that I think Steve Jobs would be envious yes. of. In this factory, they're kind of rebranding Miranda. You know, they're making a change, doing all this earth-friendly stuff. It is amazing. The production value and the money was spent just on that, like, opening five or ten minutes or so was incredible. Tilda Swinton, I really 
I, I like her anyway. You know, um, I think this is one of the best things she's ever done. And just that opening 10 minutes or five or 10 minutes, I think was just amazing. And actually Snowpiercer mm-hmm. to compare the film. She was in that. She was one of the people that was in that film that I yeah. was referencing was, you know, in both movies in that movie, she was such a caricature of like corporate of corporateness and yeah. like the the pitfalls of being in corporate America or corporate global corporations mm-hmm. or whatever. Such a caricature that I just had a hard time. It was a little much in Snowpiercer. It was a little much. And overall, I was kind of down on Snowpiercer. I didn't I, feel I, like it I went it, as yeah. far as I wanted it to or just sure. kind of got repetitive. But her mannerisms and everything in this movie just, man, so, so good. Well, let me yes. – okay. So yeah, so so plot wise, the, you're right. The, the second 15 minutes or whatever. Yeah, however, it's maybe, it's basically is, it's Mija and Okja just spending time together, almost like a silent movie for yes, a while. Which, which was which is really good, wonderful, and such a contrast to what oh, you've yeah. just seen, and yeah. have those both things together. Just man, filmmaking. Is of course, alive Okja and well. is CGI yes. for the most part. Although they they did use puppets as well in some scenes. But mostly it's CGI. Did they ever use elephant butts? <laughs> I don't That's know. That's about Because I kept thinking, like, I wonder if some scenes are doubled with, like... Yeah. Because it looks like a pig, but with the kind of... Like a rhinoceros. Of a big rhinoceros hip, or Hippopotamus elephant. type yeah, of view. Because yeah, because the way it lumbered it was, and stuff. I was it's just an interesting look. I absolutely love the creature, though. I oh, mean, yeah. I think yeah. both the way they personified it, both the way it looked visually, the texture of it was just really, really great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anything where the Okja and his friend Mija are together, I think was just wonderfully done scenes. I agree. Uh, I do think Tilda Swinton was really good. Uh, I think she's actually, compared to other performances I've seen of hers recently, she was actually somewhat restrained. But it was well done. Right. I mean, it, it, it fit what needed to be done in this film. Right. My question is, is just, you know, I wanted to show, I want to show this movie to my kids, oh. but oh my gosh, the profanity it's, is off the chart. Which I wonder, you know, who knows, but yeah. I was kind of surprised at the profanity too. And the <sighs> only thing I could think of is maybe, I, I don't know whether it was a studio thing or a my director gosh. thing where he actually wanted to make sure this was an adult film, but and it's so not an adult I mean, but it's a, it's a perfect family film. If it wasn't for the profanity th- and a few other kind of a little more severe scenes, I thought well, were a little some, intense. It can but, be kind of dark. But I mean, think about really great classic family films uh, do are dark. E.T. Yeah. was a very dark movie well, at points. You know, this could be E.T., but man, when like in the first five minutes, you got Tilda Swinton dropping the F-bomb oh, and yeah. then it's constant throughout oh, the movie. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. okay, well, you know, any chance of me getting my 10 year old to like watch this film are kind of shot now. So that, that's my only issue with it is just I wish – they had picked an audience for this because I don't know who the audience is. Oh, it's adults. I well, think no, I, I know the I adult. I know, I know it's adults, but think about adults who look at the preview of this film or look at the description and say, okay, so it's about a little girl who befriends a giant pig and all that. Okay, I'm not interested. You know, I think this movie, unfortunately, the only audience that's going to have for it is people like us that are kind of really like to like to watch really creative, inventive films and film critics. I'm just, a, I'm fearful because it's such a good film. I'm fearful it's not going to find an audience because I, adults aren't going to watch it because of the subject matter, but then kids can't watch it because it's, man, it's so I, severe. I am so glad that obviously I'm, I'm all in on this film, you know, yeah. full disclosure. I'm just, I'm all in on this film. I loved, I'm glad you did too. Oh, I did. The I benefit really did. of something like this is I have no idea because it is on Netflix. <laughs> Alan, I don't go see it in a theater. So we're like, we really don't know how we feel about it at no, all. I, I liked it and a I lot. Was I loved all, it. Yeah. I am all in on this film. The audience for this film, I really admire the director because I, I feel like, you know, like I said, I don't know if it was really his choice or like a studio thing, but I wonder if, you know, you mentioned, you referenced E.T. Um, to me, which I can see the, the echoes of that. To me, for some reason, maybe it's because it's giant CGI as opposed to, you know, E.T. was a puppet, which mm-hmm. I see the E.T. reference. But to me, this was like an adult's Pete's Dragon. And I saw the recent Pete's Dragon that came out from Walt Disney. Growing after different things, but it's still like a relationship between a creature mm. and a person. And, you know, didn't care for Pete's Dragon at all, the mm. new one. I liked the, the old Disney one when I was a kid, but the new one I didn't care for at all. And I think because maybe it was uh, this, like, I think he knew this is the film I want to make. I'm going to put in lots of swear words because I want it to be R. It's going to have some dark echoes, one of which 
I really appreciated towards the end, which I'll try not to spoil as mm-hmm. far as content, but I really appreciate the fact that he's like, nope, this is the, I think this is the film I want to make. It's going to be, it is going to have this creature and everything, but it, so you may think it's for kids, but like, don't bother trying to make it PG 13. I'm going to make it R. Yeah. And I, I just thought that was really, for I me, really admire that. Well, and, and I'm, Hey, for me personally, Alan watching this movie last night. Yeah. I mean, Hey, <laughs> I I'm, I'm on board. It connected with me. It worked for me. It's just, again, mine's more of, I guess, a business related question. It's like, okay, are you really going to be able to find a good audience for this film with it having just that, anyway, it's, it's, it's getting off the actual film itself. It's sure. more about the marketing. It's more yeah. about the, 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 the targeting of this film. My biggest fear is just, I think there's a much wider audience that could have been for this film that I don't think are going to connect with it. But you and me, I think let's the, just talk about you and me. I think the controversy you and me love is it. the best marketing this thing could have had. Possibly. So. Uh, but, but you and I, let's, let's just focus on what you and I, sure. you and I liked it. That's all that matters is, is I really, really liked it. I, uh, I liked it better than Snowpiercer. I liked it better than the host. It just, it, it played with all the right emotions. You know, it had some very emotional moments. It had some very, I think, very tense moments. Oh, absolutely. I think it had some very weird moments. We'll get to Jake Gyllenhaal in a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which a um, lot of people, if people pay attention to stuff online, a lot of people are really anti-Jake Gyllenhaal in this film. I I liked him. I'm happy he went for it. Oh, I'm still I'm still a little, the jury's out for me whether his performance completely works. But I'm just happy he went for it. I'm I mean, happy he, he, went for it. he, yeah. he, it's the, <laughs> I mean, honestly, it took me a moment to like even look up and make sure that was really him because oh. I'm just like, that doesn't seem like something that this guy would do. Well, but. and even I appreciate, you know, he did, it is a very big performance. You hear Jake Gyllenhaal's voice, what I really liked. And there yeah. again, maybe I'm reading a lot into it. You hear his voice when he is acting as this character. Yeah. Otherwise, he has this very annoying, high pitch, really like all over the place. Interesting. And so to do that shift is like, oh, now I'm being fake. And this is my voice. Like, <laughs> it is I like really, his normal Jake right, Gyllenhaal and voice. I really right, yeah. like, yeah. there again, I don't know if that was his decision, director's decision. <laughs> I don't know. But I, like you, I... I am glad that he went for it, and I really appreciated it. I didn't think it was too over the top. He, Let's to yeah. talk about the film, yeah, um, and try to get away from like you said. Let's you know focus on what we liked about the film. Yeah. One of the things I really admired was how much it was tackling. Oh yeah, okay. You have Tons. you have you know global corporations and issues with what happens mm. with that. You have vegetarianism, I guess you could say, versus eating meat. Mm-hmm. You have. Um, rights groups or environmental rights groups and the links they may go to, to protest. Yep. And I, I just liked all the, you got the old things. corporation versus, you know, what's right for people. You've got, I mean, it's just, you're right. There's a lot of things going and wrapped in I, there. I was appreciative of the fact the, um, animal liberation front <laughs> led by Paul Dano, who yeah. I think did a really good job. I, you know what? It's taken me a few films, but I'm, I'm you okay with Swiss Mr. Dano. man. I have not, okay. but I'm okay with Mr. Dano now. I ha- I would not have said that a few years ago, but I, he has redeemed himself Man. in recent years. I, I like him, okay. and um, but I can see why some people don't. But I'm um, like Swiss Army Man. This like back to back films for me with Paul Dano. Um, the Animal Liberation Front, the group that's <laughs> like the animal rights group. I like the fact that they they don't come off as some up on a pedestal group. Nope. They have faults. They have inner workings that aren't. You know, oh, yeah. sometimes their intentions aren't well thought out. Like, and I like the <laughs> fact that they're not flawless. So I like the fact that it's not just Miranda is this yeah. big devil. Oh, yeah. And you know, it's no, actually it's more yeah. of a real trying to balance things out. I mean, obviously the way the film goes, you know, the little girl likes Okja, they're going to be more hedged towards that size of yeah. like, the, but still I appreciated the fact that I thought they tried to make it a little even hand. I wanted to talk about the ALF a little bit. Cause I actually thought some Alf. of those out. <laughs> Those are like some of my favorite scenes. Not okay. only not only the humor that mm-hmm. they wove into that group, but there's one scene, and you, you alluded to it, the scene where you really question who's the bad guys here because one of their members does something that is not a good thing, nope. but doing it to help further a cause. Yep. And it's actually really glad – I'm glad I was watching the film on Netflix at that point because – there's a line of dialogue that's so critical to what just happened Mm -hmm. that flashes up so quickly. If I'd been in the movie theater, honestly, for a second, I would have been like, wait, what did I just, what did he just say? (laughs) But the fact that I could hit my little flip back 10 seconds Uh on Netflix, I'm like, Oh, yep. He did just say that. Okay. That's interesting that, you know, 
that's another reason why Netflix was kind of a nice move for this film. I actually could go back and watch a few things I felt like I was missing and wanted to make sure I captured, you know, correctly. But yeah, you're right. I think the whole ALF group was really well, well constructed uh, from a writing standpoint. Um, I will tell you probably uh, beyond the opening montage of Mija and Okja and the opening scene with Tilda Swinton, mm-hmm. um, probably my favorite moment in the film. There is a scene late in the film it's building to a conclusion and they have a parade type of outdoor event to bring together Okja and, and Mi- Mija. And it's done in this almost like a King Kong oh. bringing the creature to yeah, New York city dude, type dude. of thing. And they're going to unveil and bring the two people together. Mm-hmm. And it was tense. Mm-hmm. It was, I don't know where this is going. <laughs> it was great. It was yes, just it such was. a well-constructed scene. And, uh, and I love the ending of it. I mean, I saw some criticism about the ending online of people saying maybe it was rushed or didn't feel like it was complete. I'm like, no, I, I got it. I mean, all we cared about were two characters at the end of the film, and we know what happened to them. We got to see where they went, what they what they did. Um, it brought in a, a point from earlier in the film that you may have forgotten about, but something kind of plays a critical key role in, in resolving the film. I thought it was a great ending. I mean, I, it didn't go over the top. It wasn't messy. It wasn't... I mean, they could have ended with a really big, fast ch- you know, chase scene, action scene, whatever. And they didn't. It was a, okay, here's what's happening. Here's how this character is going to resolve it. And we're done. And here's some of the emotions left behind. Here's some of the things we walk away with. Uh, it was just a really nice, comfortable ending. So I, I really liked it from that regard, too. Yeah, I don't know... I guess there, it's melded into an ending. There's the final shot ending, and then there's some references. Let's see, I'm trying to skirt around. Um, well, the there's references to like a concentration camp. Yeah. I'm just going to say that. Mm-hmm. And the way that was done, I was not expecting that. And there's yeah. a shot, like a long dolly shot, with some characters walking in a oh, fence. Oh yeah, that's good. And <laughs> I was. Man, that was rough. And I was not expecting that. Well, but it was so powerful. Well, there's a scene, again, not spoiling, but as characters are leaving said concentration camp, and you have a an action that's made by one of the creatures to help try to save one of their own, it was really touching. I mean, yeah, yeah. even though you're realizing you're watching some CGI characters <laughs> on screen basically carry out an action, but... It was effective. It was like, okay, that just got me right there. That was really, really awesome. Um, You did watch after the credits, right? Okay. All right. I just want to make sure you did because I almost didn't. I I did. And okay, good. So if I had there is a scene after the credits. If I had to say a minus, yeah, um, it's that post credit scene. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't. Not that it's a bad scene, but I don't really understand the point at all. It didn't add anything to it, but I think it was a little bit of the idea of. The movie ended and there was a whole group of characters that we just, they're just gone. We didn't really know anything more that happened to them. I felt like this is his way of saying, oh yeah, I didn't forget about those guys. Here they are and here's what they're doing next. And I think he saw it as funny that, hey, they're kind of moving on to something else now. It was a throwaway scene. It didn't really add to the film. I don't consider it as part of the main film, but it was a... I think I would have felt it more throwaway and it didn't have some funniness to it. But it was kind of a long scene. Yeah, it, it wasn't was. like a twenty-second little thing or a thirty-second. It was, I felt like you know, two minutes. I felt I don't know if it actually was, but so that's why I was kind of like, huh. And then after it ended, I'm like, I don't really see why that was there at yeah. all. So that would be. I mean, it's not a it doesn't drag the film way down or anything. But yeah. I was just kind of like, eh. Um, <laughs> I put in my notes here that I actually think Jake Gyllenhaal out Swinton. Tilda Swinton uh, <laughs> with his performance. Okay. Because I would not have thought he would be the one to bring such an over the top performance. Oh, in no. This film. No, uh, me neither. But actually watching this, I'm like, no, Tilda Swinton's actually somewhat restrained. Agreed. He's the one that's gone gonzo on this. And it, you know what? I'll say this, even though I, see, I said in my notes. The situations had know, been reversed somehow. Yeah. It would have been so. I, and I would have been like, of course, obvious. Tilda Swinton's going. Yeah. So I'm glad that. And yeah. I, I enjoyed seeing Jake Gyllenhaal go bonkers. And she's even playing two characters. Yes. And she still is the most restrained she's 
more restrained than Jake Gyllenhaal is. Right. I, even though I'm the jury's still out whether or not I think his performance works for me, I'm fascinated to watch it again, <laughs> like for him. <laughs> yeah. So if that says anything about sure. it, sure. Yeah, I really like this film. I mean, it's not often you get a film that really balances emotion. And action, the chase scene that happens midway through the movie, kind of through an underground shopping mall, was mm -hmm. really fun to watch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not often you get a film that really balances everything really well and just is a satisfying film. It's a satisfying ending. Great, interesting performances, but enough weird, unique stuff scattered throughout to keep you on your toes, you know? So... No, I really did like it. I thought it was really good. Well, good. Awesome. <laughs> well, so we're, we got two for two. We're both, both on board with two films so crazy. far. So that's crazy. All right. Well, that was Baby Driver and Okja. Baby Driver's in movie theaters. Okja's on your TV screen if you have Netflix. And we encourage you to go check out both of them. They're both uh, worth your time. Absolutely. So let's move on after a break. We're going to talk about some movie news. I've got some Star Wars drama to talk about. The, the Star Wars universe is on, on edge right now. There's a lot happening we got to talk about. Okay. And then a couple other announcements. And then we're going to go to our recommendation uh, for capping off the episode as well. So stay tuned for Candle Films. We'll be back in just a moment. We'll get back to your show in a moment. Just a reminder, you're listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Find out more at themesh.tv and give us feedback on what you like. And now, as promised, back to your show. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on themesh.tv. As a quick reminder, you are listening to this podcast on themesh.tv. Themesh.tv is a network of podcast shows. Podcasts are these things that people record, either audio or video. Ours, in our case, is just audio put up online and people can subscribe to them just like you do a TV show on your DVR. The idea is every time we put out a new episode, you get it downloaded to you automatically. You don't have to go hunt and find the episode or see if we've published a new one. We're pushing it to you once you subscribe. So if you're not already a subscriber, we do encourage you to go do that. You can use iTunes, Apple iTunes through the podcast good store. I know Google has podcasts available any of the uh, popular internet boxes that you connect to your TV and use like Apple TV, Roku all have capability of playing podcast. We recommend you subscribe and that way you're always going to have the newest episodes we have to share with you. And there's also a lot of other shows on the mesh TV network as well. We encourage you to check out that is the mesh TV T H E M E S H dot TV. Chris, we got to hop into some news. Okay. One's probably going to take up most of our news time. The other two are just kind of quick comments. To I throw. have a guess. What's going to take up most well, of Well, I, I, I think I even teased about <laughs> it. We got Star Wars drama. Now, <laughs> since we covered two films that are maybe smaller films in our previous reviews, yeah, you know, Joe was a big budget movie, but it's not going to be blockbuster material in the summer box office uh, calculations. Right. And Baby Driver, I think, is going to do really well financially, but it's not going to be Avengers movie money. Okay. Right. So let's talk Star Wars while we can shift our brain over to the blockbuster side a little bit more. Sure. The Star Wars fan base is trembling at the moment. Several things have happened just in the last couple of weeks. That last Jedi is still going to come out. Don't worry. Last Jedi is still coming out, but <laughs> people are a little nervous right now. One, Colin Trevorrow, who was named as the director of Episode Nine, which is the one that will come out two years from this December. Right. You've got episode eight coming up this December, yep. directed by Ryan Johnson. Last Jedi. Last Jedi. Then two years after that, which will be 2019, you'll have episode nine, directed by Colin Trevorrow. If you recall, when they announced this new trilogy, and they announced J.J. Abrams was doing episode seven, they went ahead and announced Ryan Johnson and Colin Trevorrow all at the same time. Kind of gutsy. A little gutsy. J.J. <laughs> um, Abrams is a known quantity. He had done enough movies. I felt like that was a bankable decision. It's like, all right, we know what we're getting with a J.J. Abrams. Right. Ryan Johnson, a little guts here, but all of his films that he had done at that point, I think he'd made three or four films, all really well received, and all I, really good. I, I was really excited. Yeah. yeah. He did Brick. He did The Brothers Bloom. He did uh, Looper. So mm -hmm. all three really well received and really good films. But now Colin Trevorrow just came out with a film called Book of Henry that is getting trashed. People do not like this movie. 
critics are tearing it apart. It's like in the the teens on Rotten Tomatoes. Has I believe. Naomi Watts? Has Naomi Watts? It has my guy, my little kid from uh, Room, uh, the little the boy that was in Room J- is in it. Jacob Tremblay? Yeah, he's really. In it. He's. Okay, yes. I didn't realize he was. He's not boy. Henry. He's like Henry's brother. Okay, I didn't but he's in the film that. too. Huh? But it's just people are just are not connecting with it, so it's getting trashed. Wow. Now that's causing people to start wonder. Wait a minute. So so far, this guy's made three movies. Safety not guaranteed. Which I liked. You now liked. Not so much. I'm. I'm mixed on it. Uh, it was okay. Nothing great. Then he did Jurassic World, which neither of us were big fans of. But I'm not going to be a big fan of a Jurassic no. Park movie. I know that he was not. basically brought in as a director right. from a franchise that probably he didn't have a whole lot of say-so in. No. But it wasn't the best directed film. I mean, you know, it could have been better for sure. So now he's really got those two films. And now this one that's gotten trashed by critics, it's like, okay. How's his track record looking? And is he the right one to cap off this new trilogy? So there are already rumors circulating whether or not he's going to get replaced. Hmm. That's issue number one. <laughs> I'd, I'd, Putting that out there. I think, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I can see why. I think it's probably a shame because I'd still like to see a Star Wars movie done by him. But I can understand people being nervous. So. If I can just remind everybody, Return of the Jedi was the final of the trilogy of the original trilogy. I yes. love the movie. I know some people don't like it as much as the first two, but I still think it's a really good movie. Directed by a Richard Marquand, who had done some other films. I think he may have been involved with the Beatles Hard Day's Night hmm. years before, but not a director that anybody knew anything about at the time, much about. He didn't really do anything after Return of the Jedi. He's- Return of the Jedi, I'm sure, was just as much directed by George Lucas's producer, the other studio heads, everybody here's, else involved in the production. The you know, Colin Trevorrow, episode nine, there's no way it could be a Lucas prequel. That's my point. Like it's never, it's not going to get that bad. We've seen attack of the clones and revenge of the oh, Sith. So like, clones. I don't fear that it could be, you know, it can't be worse than that. I think it would be better than that. Well, in I, my opinion. I guess that's my argument too, is I don't think the director is as critical for the success of these films as it would be for an independent film or a, a real director driven film. There are so many other people involved in how these films are made. Right. That even JJ Abrams, as powerful as he is as a director, I'm sure had a lot of supervision support, you know, and other people involved in making the thing. Well, work. And my understanding too, which, you know, who knows everything's going to change, but Ryan Johnson, who is doing the last Jedi direct it, wrote it supposedly was helping write or how was going to have say so in like episode nine. So that so, makes me feel good that, you know, even if Trevor, if, you know, maybe he's not the best director, but he would still have a really good story. To there's go a off brain of. trust around him. Right, with people. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm with you on that. I think it's really kind of ridiculous to go ahead and be freaking out about episode nine. Uh, you know, let's, 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 let's get ready for episode eight first right. and, and deal with that. Right. Exactly. Second star Wars issue. So Phil Lord and Chris Miller, those of the Lego movie fame, right. 21 jump street, uh, they've been involved producer-wise on some other projects, have a real knack for irre- irreverent humor and kind of putting some really great hum- humorous spins on some very uh, kind of more traditional franchises. Mm-hmm. They were brought in to do the directing on the Han Solo movie not too long ago. Right. The filming is about 90% done, meaning they've shot tons of footage based on a Lawrence Kasdan script. And just remember, Lawrence Kasdan, he who wrote... Screenplay for Empire, Empire Strikes, Strikes Back, Back, Return yeah. of the Jedi, Force Awakens, you know, the best Star Wars movies. He has <laughs> been the one to write those. Right. Um, so word came out that they got booted. They got fired. They got canned. I mean, it was it's wow. not a it's not a peaceful separation. It's truly they were booted off the set wow. to, to say that uh, there were creative differences. That's even what their word has come out and said that yes, there absolutely were creative differences between the studio in their direction so far. Supposedly Lawrence Kasdan, not happy about the way his script was being managed and handled by these two. There are rumors that everybody in the crew applauded when they heard that these two were kicked off the project. Really? That's the rumor. Wow. Kathleen Kennedy, who is the president of Lucasfilm, supposedly not happy at all with the way that project was going. So question with that. Yeah. So Lucasfilm still has dominion over this stuff? Because I thought they sold everything to like Disney. And- well, it, Lucasfilm is still a division of Disney. Oh, Disney's see. the big, big overhead. Lucas just doesn't have anything to do with it. That's correct. Okay. Lucas, George Lucas sold Lucasfilm. And he's rolling in a vat of money. 
Yes, okay. that's correct. But he doesn't He's know. at home doing that right now. Right. Just okay. big bet of money that he just kind of rolls okay. left and right all day long. So Lucasfilm has nothing to do with him. Okay, That's correct. Okay, okay. Lucasfilm is still the production company. Got you. Just like Marvel Studios, just like Pixar gotcha. are under the, the, the Disney umbrella. Okay. So Kathleen Kennedy, Lucasfilm president. Supposedly another concern was that there were some real issues with Alden Eckerich's acting as Han Solo. Really? To the rumor saying Kathleen Kennedy had a special acting coach brought in, which is not something you typically do with an actor and this in the is, middle of production. For our listeners, this is the guy that was in Hail Caesar yes. and was awesome. Really as like good the there. cowboy guy. And yeah, that's... So we're, again... The Star Wars fan base is a little nervous right now. Huh. Because think about this. Okay. Since this whole Not reboot, only one movie, but two movies well, are like. Let's, kind let's, of back, let's broaden it out a little bit. Since this whole resurgence of Star Wars, right. you've had Episode 7, The Force Awakens, mm-hmm. and you have Rogue One. Mm-hmm. There, I believe, this is my own perception of what I see. I think people are starting to see a little bit of the gleam and glisten of Force Awakens starting to dry off a little bit. Now, I'm, I really liked. Oh, I did one. too. And there, there was all this buzz about reshoots for Rogue yeah. One, too, that there was all this like. I liked Rogue One as well, but I think people are starting to pile on a little bit more of both Force Awakens and Rogue One, just saying, okay, hmm. maybe these two films weren't really as good as we kind of thought. When, maybe we were riding that high when we all went in to go see Episode 7. This is just what people out in the community are saying. I'm not saying me. Interesting. But I think there's a little bit of a mentality of, okay, wait a minute. Episode seven, we may have just given a lot of passes to because it was episode seven. And we were it was ready for it. Getting the bad yeah. taste of the Lucas prequels out of our mouths. Rogue One, supposedly they had to go in and do a lot of reshoots and right. re- redoing the film at the end to make it a little more appeasing to, to fans. Now we got this concern about episode nine. Now we got this concern about the solo movie. I think it's just, you know, there's a lot of drama going on right now. And I think if people are worried, huh. here's my take on it I think it's all going to come down to December. If, oh, La- if Last Jedi knocks it out of the park, we won't hear anything about complaining about what's going on in the Star Wars universe. Well, let's, let's put just a tiny bit of perspective on Last Jedi and mm-hmm. Ryan Johnson and why I'm probably setting myself up for disappointment. <laughs> both of us liked Force Awakens. Yes. But if listeners will remember, we were both like, yep, yeah, but it was very similar. Oh, it was very Story similar. wise, you've mm-hmm. got a big Death Star. You know, it was just like, it was really well made. We liked a lot of the actors. Some of the humor was funny. You know, there were some surprises in there that we weren't expecting. Mm-hmm. But some parts of it just seemed way too familiar. Absolutely. But the whole time I was telling myself, that's okay. Yep. Because Ryan Johnson is a very creative writer who's done some original movies, some really original movies. He's the writer and director of Episode Eight, so you know I'm kind of like it, it's okay. You know I don't I don't I don't feel like he'll just turn out another product that I'll I'll yep I'll have those feelings about. But I could be wrong. Probably setting myself up way too. Well, and I'm, I think that's where what you just described is. I think what a lot of Star Wars fans are saying to themselves. Episode Seven, yeah, I enjoyed it. Right. Could have been better, you know, could have been more original, whatever. That's why I think episode eight right now coming out in December is so critical. If that movie sure. does not do well, like response wise, I think we've got major issues in the Star Wars universe going forward. <laughs> um, my prediction is I my gut feeling is that episode eight, I feel like I feel like it's going to be very, very good. But I also think it may be divisive with I, fans. And I feel like I, I could see that. And I think I will be on the side of I like it and I'm glad it's radically different. But I could see some people being like, what I'm are you talking pre- I'm about? Predicting they that. ruined it. Like, I, I, could see I that. can totally predict that. I could see that. Because I think they got the safe one out of the way. Yep. With episode seven, we yep. knew what we needed to do to get this franchise started back up. I think Ryan Johnson and, and the rest are saying, all right, let's, let's, let's push some buttons. Let's do some things different here. That's my hope anyway. Yeah. But I do think it will cause some division in the uh, Star Wars universe. So we will see in about six months if we are correct or not. Can't wait. Okay. So that's the most dramatic news I had to share. Okay. Let's go on to one that still is, to me, dramatic, but there's not really a whole lot more to say about it. Daniel Day-Lewis is retiring. Now, has he retired before? Is he like... No. Um, no, no. Okay. I, I do not believe he has ever... He's not like Steven Soderbergh where he's retired from making movies and he's come back and no. made movies. Okay. No, he's not like the Eagles or <laughs> Steven Soderbergh okay. or any of these other guys. He has not offic- ever officially retired from acting but as far as I know. he is. He is. Okay. He's got one last film coming out this year and it is a P.T. Anderson film. 
Uh, I don't think they have a name for it yet. It's, it's about the, fashion. It's about the fashion world of London back in the 1950s. Okay. So he's in it. That is his starring role. That'll be, according to him, his last role. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Chris, maybe a little early to do a retrospective on this guy, but Daniel Day-Lewis, what was, the best, what was his best performance in your mind uh, that you can think of? Man, um, so My Left Foot, um, Gangs of New York, mm-hmm. um, There Will Be Blood. Yeah. And then Lincoln and then Lincoln. So those are the ones I'm familiar with. He may have been another star. Oh, he was in nine, which is like an adaptation of a musical. That is one I did not ever see. I have seen that. So I would say probably my favorite of his performances. Mm -hmm. Well, I I think was, was probably there will be blood. Um, I mean, it's all over the top. You know, Daniel Plainview, he plays this larger than life character. He's chewing scenery. I mean, the whole milkshake meme, that's all him. But, I liked the movie, and I think he was really strong. If you want to go for a more subtle, nuanced performance, which shows you his range, actually, Mm -hmm. um, Lincoln. I think Lincoln. Lincoln is a movie I was kind of like, eh, take or leave it. But his performance and kind of his subtleness and the way he would tell stories, which was supposedly how Lincoln did tell stories, was very, like, folksy and everything. I just – I think he's a really good actor. Um you know, if he wants to retire, I guess, you know, so be it. But it's a shame because I think he's really talented. Well, that's the thing. Who knows how many more he could possibly want to do. But, you know. I hear these people talk about retiring and, you know, I'm just like, oh, okay, great. Good for them. Him, I'm honestly disappointed or sad. And I'm just like, you know, this guy makes so few films. Right. Um, you know, My Left Foot. He did. He had Last of the Mohicans. Oh, which, Last of the Mohicans. Which I was Forget in, about by the way. That's I right. was in that film. I just want to make that clear. My IMDb <laughs> credit should awesome. show extra in Last of the Mohicans. Awesome. The Age of the Innocents, the uh, Scorsese okay. film, which I okay. really liked. And The Name of the Father, which I also liked. Jim Sheridan film, very good. The Crucible, never saw that one with Winona Ryder, I believe. Um, the Boxer, I did see it. I just don't remember much about it. Um, Gangs in New York. The Ballad of Jack and Rose, another one I've never seen. Well, I think I think we're I think we need to we need to like catch up a on a few of these. Yeah, because yeah, Ballad of Jack and Rose I haven't seen. I don't think I've seen the Boxer either. Yeah. Then you've got There Will Be Blood, Nine, and Lincoln. Okay. So I mean, he has made more films than maybe we we gave him initial credit for, but it's still not a huge list of films. Right. And the fact that Lincoln was 2012. This new one will be coming out in 2017. That's five years apart for an actor. That's a pretty you big gap. Because I think he won Oscars for Lincoln and There Will Be Blood, right? I'm pretty sure he did for Lincoln. I don't know about There Will Be Blood. I don't know if he won Best Actor or not. But I wonder if there had to be a lot of uh, bargaining by Anderson to get him to do this one. I wonder if he was kind of already retired, like in his mind, and whether Anderson was like, no – just do this one. Just do this one for me. He's do like, this oh, one, and then you're okay, done. Okay, but you're then out. I'm going to actually make a public statement that I am done. Done. Yeah, <laughs> so. could be. It's just a shame because I've always liked watching him. Oh yeah. Even his most showy role, the one that people talk about, Gangs in New York, as Bill the Butcher. I still think it's a really fun performance, mm-hmm. and really, in, in a, a mediocre movie, he made it really, really strong right. just by his performance. So, always had to say, a really great actor, not going to be acting anymore. Um, I kind of hope it doesn't stick. I'd love to see him do something else a little bit later in life. But if he does stop, uh, we've got several really, really good films he did, great performances. And maybe this new P.T. Anderson film will be yeah, really good as well. Yeah, here's hoping it's good. <laughs> I hope so. It would be nice there to be a, a final swan song for his, his, his career. Right. All right. And then the last thing I was going to mention to you, Chris, and this is more just of, of interest to kind of okay. call your attention to because okay. we have certain – directors or people that you and I kind of like to talk about a lot and kind of follow and see what they're doing next. And David Gordon Green is one of those people. Yes. Um, he kind of creeps into our conversation a good bit. He does. A, you and I have been in the same room with him before, which is always kind of nice to say. Yeah. Um, B, he's got a lot of North Carolina based connections. You know, there's a lot of reasons we like to follow him. He kind of started out very independent filmmaker, had a few brushes with some bigger budget films, Kind of settled back into some more independent films again. So there's a film coming out just here in a, a few weeks, I think, called Stronger. Hmm. You know anything about it? I do not. Jake Gyllenhaal. Okay. And then also you've got uh, Tatiana Mas- Maslani, who is the star of or- Orphan Black, the TV show, the BBC show. Heard of it. Really before. good show. Okay. She's really good in it. Okay. And this will be the first movie I think I've seen her like she's starring in. Okay. Two of them are in this film. It's about a victim of the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013 that Jake Gyllenhaal plays. 
But they're helping the police track down the killers while he's struggling to recover from the devastating trauma. Here's the deal, Chris. I'm watching trailers at home, trying to look at films that may be coming out later in the year, and I see this movie stronger with Jake Gyllenhaal. I'm like, huh, let me check this out. Watch the trailer, I'm like, eh, it looks like it could be a good film. It looks like it either could be very... Just they, pulling at heartstrings. They just and recently had a movie about the They Boston did. Marathon. It was called Patriot's Day, I believe. Yeah, with um, Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg. Right. This one is more of a of just focusing on this one person that was mm. a survivor and kind of the impact on him. Mm. But it gets to the end of the uh, end of the trailer. It's like directed by George, uh, David Gordon Green. I'm like, really? So I go look it up. He didn't write it. Okay. This is very much like what he did with the uh, Ark Brandis Crisis movie where he wasn't a producer. He didn't write it. He just was brought in as a director. Hmm. So this is now another film he's directing that's coming out this year. This will be released before he is doing that Halloween redo that that we already talked about. Yeah, yeah. That one's exciting. He is producing and writing that. This is one that you kind of get the sense he got brought in to direct. But I always am fascinated to see what he does with it. So I'm I'm interested. When does it come out? Soon. <laughs> Soon. Okay. I, I don't I don't remember exactly the date, but uh, huh. I know it's it's the trailer's out, and it's one of those where it's promoting the film as being relatively soon from now. And it's called Stronger. Stronger. Okay. And again, tying in our Jake Gyllenhaal connection with the Oak Jump review. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Stronger. Let me see. I got, I've got a release date coming up. Come on, IMDb, September twenty second. <laughs> Which is why I was looking at it. So, yes, it is uh, in late September. David Gordon Green as the director. But, yes, it's based on a book called Stronger. Okay. And But two other writers are doing the screenplay of it. So, okay. could be interesting. All right. Yeah. That is news. Chris, you got anything uh, to add? No, no. I'm, that's We're good? We're good, yeah. Well, then that is our second portion of the show. Now we move on to our final, final, ultimate end of the show where Chris and I both share our recommendation of a film that we think is worth checking out. Chris, I'm going to let you go first, if that's okay, <laughs> because I do have a time restraint, and I want to make sure I'm keeping my, my, my portion under, under our time limit. Okay. So let me let you go ahead and go first. So uh, the movie I'm going to recommend is John Michael McDonough's latest. It came out, I think, pretty much straight to Netflix, which is kind of an interesting thing with mm-hmm. Okja had done that. John Michael McDonough is the director of The Guard and most recently Calvary. Mm -hmm. Uh, War on Everyone is the name of it. It's an action comedy. It stars Alexander Skarsgård and Michael Pena uh, as the two two cops who are very, 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 very very corrupt Mm. and set out to blackmail a criminal, and it doesn't really go very well. (laughs) Um, So this movie... Interestingly enough, because I think I know where your recommendation and stuff is going, um, has not been well received, which Hmm. maybe is why it went straight to Netflix. Um, It has, like, I've seen people give it one star. Roger, the Roger Ebert website gave it one star out of, they usually like four stars is their highest. They gave it one star. I've seen a lot of people just being brutal to this movie, saying the tone is all over the place. and They didn't see the chemistry between the two leads, uh, Skarsgård and Pena. Well, I disagree. Mm. Um, I think there is chemistry there. This, to me, is like an independent version of 21 Jump Street. Okay. Um, it is It is very dark. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was talking earlier about how I had problems a lot of times with criminal films that glorify violence and or crime. And I right. don't think Baby Driver did that. But, you know, it could maybe be dangerous about doing that. Mm-hmm. But we're on everyone <laughs> – it's interesting because they don't set up the two leads as people you necessarily like because Hmm. a, they're corrupt and B they just say all sorts of offensive things. Right. Um, It's kind of like this movie was made by Trey Parker and Matt Stone of South Park (laughs) because it's like they just set out to offend all different nationalities, sexual orientations. It's just like everything is fair game and they offend all over the board. Wow. But kind of knowing that going in, because I'd kind of gotten a little bit of kind of word on this movie, Mm. I ended up, I I actually like it, which is why I'm recommending it. Now, granted, it is not for everyone. It is a very hard R rating. Okay. Uh, If you don't appreciate black humor or dark humor, do not see this. Yeah. But um, John Michael McDonough, I really like his writing. I Mm. really liked Calvary, which was a heavy movie, but not a comedy at all. I have not seen Calvary, and that's something I really need to see. Man, Brendan Gleeson's in that, and he's amazing. 
Um, anyways, uh, John Michael McDonough, he's an interesting director. He doesn't, he's only made, I think this is only his third film, but War on Everyone, it is available on Netflix. Uh, not for everyone, but it was for me, even though yeah. it's War on Everyone, <laughs> which I think actually the title is very, it's like War on Everyone. It's just like, yeah. Yeah, we're that's gonna pretty much saying lots of the tone we're going to yeah. take here. But um, I really liked I, it. Honestly, a lot of the dialogue I thought was good. So I really, this one slipped under the radar. I didn't even know this was around. So I need to, I need to check that out. Because I, I did like The Guard. I have not seen Calvary, and that's one that I definitely need to have. It's on my watch list as well. Um, so yeah, War on Everyone. Okay, good. Good yeah. call on that. Okay, so I think, me, I think it's one of those things where you're either going to like it's like you said, divisive. You're yeah. either going to like it, or you're going to hate it. Yeah. <laughs> so I liked it. Well, speaking of liking or hating, um, so my recommendation, I am breaking the rules. A, I don't necessarily consider this a recommendation because if you have ten dollars to blow on a movie, it should not be this movie, and it go is see still ba- playing. Go see Baby Driver. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm giving this as a. As I'm talking about this during this segment. Because I do feel like even though right now today this film is not available online, based on its current box office performance, it will not be long before it's available (laughs) online. I'll I'll tell you that. I know what movie you're going to see. So I was driving home from a a work meeting, and I had some extra time before I really needed to get home. And I really wanted to see a film, and there was actually a film I was going to see. I was going to see Book of Henry. There was a movie theater. On my way home, I'm like, hey, Book of Henry's playing there. Great. I'm going to go check that out. So I stop and go up to the nice lady at the box office and say, I'd like to see Bob Book of Henry. She's like, we're sorry, but that theater, there's a you know, pro- problem with the projector, so we can't show that film today. I'm like, oh, that sucks. I'm like, okay. I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm already here. There's a movie theater in front of me. Scanning the, the list, I'm like, okay, what am I going to watch? So I end up watching The Mummy with Tom Which Cruise. Which you had been kind of – we talked about it on the show. You were kind of excited about. I was – Curious about it. excited is not the word. Okay, I was curious about it. I think the idea of trying to bring bring back the classic Universal horror movies uh, car- uh, creatures is a is an interesting move, and I think something really interesting could be done with it. I am not one to bash Tom Cruise naturally. I think Tom Cruise makes interesting acting choices. Is he a good actor? Yeah, he's fine, but I think he, generally speaking, doesn't get into really crappy movies. That's just me. That's okay. what I'm saying for the record. And I've seen the Rotten Tomatoes scores by this point. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like in the teens. People are trashing it. So it's, I'm, it's I, after Earth level of Rotten oh Tomatoes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm choosing to go see this movie more as a research project. I'm like, I want to understand. You want to see the train wreck and see how bad yeah. it is. I mean, because here's a film that I thought sounded like it could hold some promise when it was first announced. I understand what they're trying to do with this whole new universe of universal monster creatures. And, you know, and I, I, generally speaking, Tom Cruise doesn't make terrible acting decisions. So I'm going to go see it. All right. I will say it's not a great movie. That's, let's just go ahead and get that out on the, on the table. It's not one I would say if you've got money to go spend. Do not go see The Mummy. <laughs> when it comes on HBO, Netflix, or iTunes for a $1.99 rental, I actually think it's something to check out. Which apparently is not going to be long. It will saying. not be long. Okay. There's some reasons why I think this, this movie is getting the bad press that it's getting. I, I think there's three distinct reasons why. And it's not fair to the movie. Okay, I would say on the surface, if you strip these other preconceived notions away from what reviewers are doing in this movie, it's not a horrible movie. Okay. It is not deserving of the low, low Rotten Tomatoes scores getting. But the reasons I think is it's kind of been a good punching bag for people. One, people got to have a punching bag. Well, that actually is one of my, that's like my fourth reason. I think people do like to have a punching bag. And I think every year you kind of have to have one. And I think right now, this is it. Two, it's called The Mummy. There was a mummy movie back in the 90s. Brandon Fraser. Brandon Fraser. People generally liked it. I did not. I thought it was horrible. But generally people liked it. They made two sequels from it. And the Scorpion King spinoff. Yeah. yeah. So you really got four movies off this whole mummy brand. And that wasn't that long ago. Right. I think the fact that it's still called exactly the same, The Mummy. And it's got the same problem I think Spider-Man's faced in its recent iterations is that people are like, well, we just saw a version of this character six years ago, seven years ago, whatever it was. I think there's some of that immediacy of the name The Mummy that people are just kind of, yeah, we don't need another one. Two... Tom Cruise. I think people want to see Tom Cruise fail. Uh, <laughs> I think they do. You take the Scientology, the news, the, 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 the rumors. I think people want to see him fail. And the fact that he doesn't fail very often 
in his in his films. He's kind of like the Yankees of movies. Yes, right. If you got a chance to show Tom Cruise in a really bad movie that he's starring in, throw darts at it. Go for it. Knock I it see. down. The third issue I think with that, that made it a punching bag for people is that they announced so early on that this was going to be part of a shared universe. And I think people are so burnt out on this idea of every movie having to be part the of a shared universe. The dark universe, universe is yes. what it's called? Okay. They could have easily wove this shared universe idea into the movie as a surprise. Not promote it that way, not mark it up that way, not make it this big deal that is kicking off this whole universe. But I think when they did that and they made such a big deal about it, people are like, eh, I'm out. <laughs> I'm, We've I'm already got the DC universe. We've got uh, the Marvel universe. We've I'm got the universe Star Wars out. universe. We've got the Star Trek universe. We're done with universe. Heck, we even have a King Kong Godzilla universe right, at this point. Right, right. People are just done with it. So I think there's those three reasons. And then you add the fourth one that you already alluded to. People like to have a punching bag. And I think this is it. So here's what I'm going to say really quick. What's good about the movie? Tom Cruise plays a jerk. And he's a jerk most all the film. And I think that seems to be his thing now, is he wants to play jerky characters. Because okay. he was a jerk in, what was a recent movie he was in that I was, I was commenting on that he was in, that he played a jerk. He played a bad, oh, uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Okay. He played a, a coward. He played, Did you like you know, that okay? Yeah, Maybe. it was a good movie. Um, so anyway, he's a jerk in this movie. Or live, die, and repeat, as it's now called. <laughs> right. Two, this movie for a PG-13 movie actually had some scary moments. There were some moments that were, yeah, it was kind of creepy. And some of the uh, makeup work was pretty creepy on some, some characters. And, hmm. you know, it had zombies and it had like a, you know, a lot of creepy imagery at times. So okay. it's capitalizing on it being more of a horror movie than the Brendan Fraser movies were. Three, I thought it had a good ending. I liked the way it ended. I'm not going to say what it is, but I thought it was a good ending. Four, Jake Johnson, who's in it. He's the uh, guy, he's been in that TV show New Girl, he's been in some independent movies, Drinking Buddies. Um, okay. Really funny guy. I have seen Drinking Buddies, so I think I yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah, he's a really funny guy. He is funny in this movie. Okay. And I'm, I'll go ahead and spoil this, because I know most of you are not going to see this movie. <laughs> I'm going to um, see it, I think. Well, uh, this, is, this is not a spoiler. He's dead most of the movie. Hmm. Okay? Like, but if you, were, if you can think about American Werewolf in London. Mm-hmm buddy that's dead talking to him the whole time mm. we got that going on which i thought was kind of creepy the way they do it is kind of creepy and i think it's kind of cool so already there's a few things going for this movie now i will say bad wise yeah it's very predictable it's action is not the best in the world uh there's no chemistry whatsoever between tom cruise and his lead actress that you're supposed to buy into there's a lot of things that did not work in this movie for sure but I just don't think it warrants the bad well, thrashing it's getting right now. Your recommendation or statement and diatribe <laughs> rant, I I was not going to give this movie a chance. I never wanted to see it. We uh, The Rotten Tomatoes ratings came out. It was getting slammed, so we didn't review it here on the show. Hearing all that, I do want to I do want to catch up. With okay. It. I'm just saying, Chris. Don't go into it thinking that there's like a gem in there somewhere because of the way I'm talking. It's not. Don't worry. The bar it's couldn't a, be any lower. It's a, but it's not as bad as what's being set out there. An ant couldn't limbo under the bar that's okay. been set Good. for this movie. Well, then so. you may actually come away with it saying, yeah, yeah. it's all right. You know, because that's kind of where I went into it. I went in with really low expectations now. I came out being like, all right, it wasn't great, but come on. Was it well, really that bad? Maybe it will yeah. be our joint nominee for the movie that was unfairly maligned at the end of the year. Because right now right it now sounds it like it's your mine. front runner. Right now it would be mine. It's my Lone Ranger. It's my, right. um, you know, some other films that we both said were, yeah, it was okay. Right. This one was, it was okay. It was all right. Um, not great. And there's some definitely things I would have done different, but it's not bad. So that's the mummy. Uh, okay. It's a... Not really a recommendation. It's more of a defense. Sure. In defense of the mummy is, <laughs> is what my recommendation turned into. Awesome. All right. So that being said, I think that's our, our show. So okay. we're on everyone and eh, kind of the mummy are our recommendations. We talked about Star Wars drama. We talked about Daniel Day Lewis. We talked about um, da- David Gordon Green. We did our reviews of Okja. We did our review of Baby Driver. Both we're giving very high marks to and saying are definitely worth your time checking out. And I think that should wrap us up. So if you are interested in following us, please do so 
by subscribing to the show. And that way you make sure that you always get the new ones from us, new episodes that we uh, published and they're available on your phone, your tablet, your computer, wherever you want to have them delivered. Chris, if anybody did want to reach out to us and communicate with us though, how would they do that? Just send us an email at info at the mesh TV, put foot candle in the subject line and tell us, what you like, don't like about the show, a movie we were wrong or right about, or tell Alan how awesome the mummy is and <laughs> yes. how you are so thankful he is the lone voice in the wilderness telling you to go check it out. Now, I, I never once said, go check it out. <laughs> I just said, if you are given the opportunity to see it in a cheap, easy, convenient format, it's not a bad use of your time. That's Fair all enough. I'm saying. So please understand, <laughs> don't go run out and see the mummy. Just if you stumble across the mummy, let me know what you think about it. So. Also, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't say they're throwing, throwing out another plug for the Foot Candle Film Festival, which will be in September 22nd through the 24th. Uh, we are going to be announcing our lineup in mid-July or so. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, we've got a bunch of good films that we're looking forward to bringing. We're just in the narrowing down process and firming up the lineup right now. But we are excited about it. What's the date we said we we're going to announce films? Like mid-July sometime? Uh, Mid-July, probably around 14th, 15th, something yeah, like okay. that. Good. We should be able to have that done by then. Guess we got to finish watching some movies. Yes. All right. So stay tuned. We will definitely, probably by the time we do our next podcast episode, We'll have a little more specificity about the festival we can talk about if we're if the timing works out right. And just to throw this out there, the website for that is footcandlefilmfestival.com. Yes, all one word, yeah. footcandlefilmfestival.com. So with that, let's wrap it up. Thanks so much for listening. We appreciate it. And let us know if you've got any thoughts or feedback. But otherwise, we will uh, we will talk to you during our next episode. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Tuller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Tuller, visit www.carpaltuller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard. I'm glad awesome. you liked it, too. Yeah, I, I did. Really, I liked it. I'm I glad you really, liked it too. really, really, really liked it. Yeah, it was fun. It was <laughs> and a I wasn't, fun movie. I thought I would just be like, oh, because I wasn't big on Snowpiercer. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, you know, it's. I, I will say, I was like, man, I really like this. I will movie. say, I was not sure. As much as I love the montage, the scene with her and Okja in the in the jungle or out in the wilderness in the very beginning, I loved it. Yeah. It was so great. It did make me wonder if, like, okay, am I going to like the rest of this movie though? Because this is a nice it moment. Actually, it started to get a little long for me, and I was little, like, oh, it's a little cute. Well, honestly, but- when he saves her, like, whips her around, I'm right? Like, I'm like, okay, are they? Are they going kids movie with this? Because right. this is a very kids movie moment. Right. And I'm like, if that's the direction they're going the rest of the film, I may be checking out. I mean, I may not be enjoying it. Sure. But then it came back around and you got the ALF involved. and, and The tells, Miranda Corporation. Right. Well, it's like Come the whole on. thing is like the scenes with, with Miranda and her whoever the guy was, the black guy. Oh my assistant. gosh, I didn't even mention him. Oh, he was. So I, love, I love him. He was in Breaking Bad. Oh, see, and I never he's saw in Better Call show. Saul. He's never. in both of those. He now, Grant, you could say he stereotypes his plan like the cool, collected bad oh, guy. But man, when he goes, he up and is fixes so coffee. freaking amazing. Yeah, well, she's like freaking <laughs> out. He just goes up there and makes an espresso. Man, it was so good. good, so good. I will say though, when when they push that little baby pig out to be oh, saved, devastating. Because it was Gosh. already like it looked. It yeah. wasn't black and white, but it looked black and white. It had very like Schindler's oh, List type stuff, going and the bar bar. And yeah, you know, pigs are still being Man. killed, and they push that pig out. It was over. It yeah. was. It was got really it dusty. Really, but I'm so happy it <laughs> so ended good. the way it did with them back in their village. You got yeah. Okja. You got the here's, little baby pig. I mean, it's like here, here's a question. That's, that's Two it. questions. Yeah. First off, I'm going to ask you, um, Jay. You don't have to leave this in unless you want to <laughs> put it after the credits. What did you, what were you meaning when you said something you forgot about that kind of comes back around and the uh, the gold pig? Oh, 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 oh. 
the little okay. gold pig. I mean, you know, yeah. it's brought up early in the film. She tucks it in her, her little patch, uh, satchel, and you never, you don't think about it later. And then right. when she opens up her satchel and brings it up, and like, that's ah, the trade. Yeah, the gold pig. Because you're wondering, how is she going to get out? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. But that it's, was, like, it's all money. It's like the woman's just money. like, it's a commerce decision. It's like, okay, if I let go of one pig, but I get this solid gold pig. And I think done. she's also weighing bad publicity, you know, yeah. and she's like, well, we've already got, okay, I'll just take, cause it is worth a lot of money. The grandfather oh, yeah. said, this is all it's this solid money. gold. It's yeah. a solid gold pig. Um, that's true. That's a really good yeah. point. Um, yeah. okay. So at the end, when they're in the village and you know, they they go to have, she like touches Ocha and it's like, she's staring and she kind of gets this smile. I yeah. was wondering, I thought she saw something. I think she's, She's just Listening realizing. No, I think he's talking to her. Uh, There's like, I played it back because I was questioning the same thing. If you listen, he's making noises. Noises. And she's just sitting there listening to him. So it's almost and like. she just, starts to get this really big smile on it. Yeah. Okay. I think it's just a matter of. She's, you remember, you know, there's the part where she's asking to be put on the phone with Oak Ja. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, she's got this connection. She, right. they're, they're friends. They communicate. And I think her just listening to him cause he's making really faint noises. Kind of this like okay. whining little like hype type of noise. Okay. And it's just, I think she's just listening to him wow. and then she smiles because she likes whatever he just told her. And, right. You know, it was huh. nice. It was a really cool ending. So yeah, it yeah. was cool. Awesome. Yeah, actually, that's one I probably will end up watching again soon. So yeah, I can. You know, it's it's a fun that. it's a fun movie to watch. So yeah, and it is all over the place, crazy. Yeah. It's like a Terry Gilliam movie almost. Well, I'll tell you what happened. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm watching this film. I'm like, all right, this may be a, a good one to, to show the kids. <laughs> the first time Tilda Swinton says that whole, you know, and they better. F- can taste good. I'm like, okay, so <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Maybe, maybe they're not going the kid route. All right. Well, I said that may be the one f bomb they're allowed to get away with because it was kind of funny when she said it. And then they had this nice montage of the, them playing out in the woods mm-hmm. and the rescue. I'm like, okay, no, this is the totally a family movie. I can have the family watch this. <laughs> then we get back to the rest of the movie, and it's like every other sentence. It's like, okay. I mean, you know, it's language. I'm not so hung up on language that I think my kids well, can't hear bad the, words. But the, you know, you talk, I know you talked about. Um, when the guy lies about the translation, mm-hmm. rough. Then when Paul Dano finds out, yeah. he freaking like Just beats the guy like yeah. Chuh, and you're like, whoa, like yep. really intense, yeah. like beating him. And you're like, and that's the thing where it's like, okay, yeah, animal liberation front. But sometimes you're like, okay, oh yeah, no, it's you know like. Although I, I loved it, the uh, when the guy that the one who lied about the translation comes back and he comes back, he's got the yeah. tattoo. Yeah, 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 translations matter or something like right. that, and like. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was good. No, it's it's, it's a very well made well made movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Okay.